Lord forgive me for this trap shit Sergeant Smack make it backflip Telly hanged it with the action With the vato speaking Spanish Frank Matthews how I vanish Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut Go BBS is on a beamer When Fat Cat was tearing queens up Fall off the profit not the re Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus Uptown like I'm Baby Man Just caught a touchdown from the base the first priority for Bridgeport's new top cop is put the cuffs on crime. A new program is already credited with cutting the crime rate in Connecticut's largest city. And Fox Connecticut's Tom Lewis has more on what's being done to make the streets safer in an exclusive report. Tom? Sarah, good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. Bridgeport is no different than any other large city. Now, with a bulging population comes crime. But many feel that the Park City is being unfairly singled out as a violent city. An episode of Family Guy even took a shot at the city. But that tide could be turning. Even with a murder rate that nearly doubled last year, overall crime is down. Their new chief is a longtime veteran of law enforcement. And they're taking aim at troubled neighborhoods with an in innovative new strategy. I received the 911 hang up. Like any big city, Bridgeport is grappling with crime. But with a new permanent police chief and an innovative violent crime prevention team, there is reason to believe in a city that suffers from what many say is an unfair rap. And the cop at the top, Chief Joseph Gaudet, is somebody Bridgeport residents can relate to. My dad, who was born in Bridgeport, um, Went on the Bridgeport Police Department in 1957, was here till 1980, retired as a sergeant. And then uh, I started on the job here at uh, 22 in 1983. Under Gaudet, overall crime is down, but last year the Park City saw an unusual spike in homicides, jumping 90% from the previous year. We've had some domestic violence issues here, and, and those are so hard to, to, to you know, preempt. Um, although, uh, you know, we're going to try to make some efforts uh, as we go forward in uh, combating domestic violence and hopefully we'll be able to reduce those numbers as well. Gaudet has reinstituted gun buybacks and between those and guns that were confiscated during arrest, nearly 400 guns are gone and off the street. But perhaps the most effective tool in bringing the overall crime numbers down in Bridgeport is their violent crime initiative led by Sergeant Ron Mercado. He and his team cruise what they call hot zones, a presence that has drastically reduced crime in some of Bridgeport's most intimidating neighborhoods. It's a new law. What me and, and the guys look for is um, we're mainly targeting a gang element or a group, um, groups loitering in, in certain areas in these hot zones. A lot of the robberies usually start with groups congregating, whether it be at a corner store uh, or at a lot. From there, they'll find a victim, they'll target a victim, they'll go out, they'll rob them, whether it's strong arm, which means there's no weapon displayed, um, or with um, firearm. Mercado is often greeted with thankful gestures from residents, who now feel safer on their own streets, earning respect by settling for nothing less than obeying the law. Hey, put that away. Slow down. And like Chief Gaudet, Mercado has long family ties to the city streets that he patrols every night. I grew up in Bridgeport. I grew up in, in this hot zone. Um, and I've, I've left this area about 20 years ago. And I could see the change of, of, of the area when, you know, when I was young and as, as I grew up into what it is now. And I'd like to see it come back to the, the nice area that it was when I was a kid. We've helped the people there to feel a little, you know, a lot safer, and uh, we feel good about it. We feel real good about it. Now, Chief Gaudet and Sergeant Mercado have a vested interest in keeping Bridgeport safe. They are homegrown, and they take pride in providing their neighbors with that sense of security. Bridgeport has a state-of-the-art arena. They've got a top-notch minor league baseball park, a world-class university, and a population of hard-working, good people. And now a rededicated focus on taking the steps to retake the streets. Tom Lewis, Fox, Connecticut. Tom, thank you. Yo, yo, we back. It's your boy pop a lot. Mob ties. We on our way to Connecticut with it. Bridgeport. 
P.T. Barnum to be exact. If I'm not mistaken, this is our second time around here. We getting a little familiar. But y'all meet us at the middle court or D top to be exact. Now, if my memory serves me correctly, the last time we was here, we were covering Frankie the Terminator Estrada. And I might have mentioned the person that we're covering today. And if not, it was just an effort to get our facts correct because this is definitely somebody that I got a lot of requests on and definitely somebody that needs to be covered out of the city of Bridgeport. Now, the person that I'm going to be covering today is going to be a guy by the name of Luke Jones or Luke Mega Jones or just Mega in Bridgeport or in PT. Now, according to my research, it looks like Mega was very heavy and active during the decade of the 1990s, and it's going to culminate at the end of the 90s. And pretty much P.T. Barnum, the housing projects, well, first we know it from the circus, Ringlam and Barnum Circus, um, but this ain't no fun and games around this bitch, or it wasn't. Now... It was built in 1951. It's a 481-unit, or was a 481-unit, 22-building complex for low-income families. And it also happens to be the state's largest public housing complex. So, in and around the time of 1995 to 1990, and I'm 100% sure before then, it had to be a very lucrative market for drug dealers, as far as for drug users, just the amount of units that it has there, especially being the largest in the state. Now, based on my research present and past, pretty much PT is described as almost, almost like a drug haven. And it was split up or separated into different factions. And they're going to say that the Luke Mega Jones organization ran the middle part it was also talks of another organization by the name of the foundation and they also mentioned frankie the terminator estrada so based on the portrayals in the media it was a very violent and competitive drug market and really you can't talk about luke jones without talking about several other members of the jones family some being his brothers some being his nephews i'm gonna have lonnie t jones leonard t jones lyle t jones jr and lance t jones now with the exception of lance who is serving an effective sentence of 54 years of imprisonment all of the other jones family members who were members of the enterprise at that time are serving life sentences on a variety of charges, including narcotics trafficking, racketeering, racketeering conspiracy, conspiracy to commit murder, and firearm related offenses. Now, it took me a while to get to Luke Mega Jones in particular because it's just so much that has to do with this case. At one time, it was a death penalty case, which he ended up being found innocent on the murder charges that were alleged against him but the drug conspiracies was enough to get him a life sentence now another guy that needs to be mentioned is going to be a gentleman by the name of aaron harris and he's very important to the story because it seems like he was the tie to the drugs from their supplier in the bronx which was a gentleman by the name of manuel hinjosa who would presumably end up testifying against Aaron Harris in the organization. Now, he would testify that he met Aaron Harris in the fall of 1997, and he described himself as a heroin and cocaine supplier from the Dominican Republic with a number of employees who worked on his behalf distributing heroin and cocaine. Now, the supplier would testify that sometime in the fall of 1998, he delivered a kilogram of cocaine to Harris in Connecticut, and Harris took him to someone's apartment and told the occupants of the apartment to vacate, where Harris would proceed to convert over 100 grams of cocaine into crack cocaine on a stove in the apartment. Now, the supplier would admit that he expressed skepticism about Harris 
stating that he was afraid that Harris might have been an undercover officer. It was at that point where Harris would agree to prove to the supplier that he was not. Now, it was said that Harris and the supplier would travel to Connecticut, where Harris would drive him around Bridgeport, showing him several drug blocks. Now, in particular, the supplier remembered a red brick housing project near Exit 25 off of I-95 in Bridgeport, where the supplier was unable to name the housing projects, but he provided directions that would lead directly to the P.T. Barnum housing projects in Bridgeport. Now, based on my research, it really wouldn't be the drugs that would bring the organization down. It would really be the series of, it would be the series of several murders. One, the killing of Anthony Scott, and another one, the murder of Montanil Lawrence that we're going to discuss further, that would really bring the organization down, as well as a series of different shootings that pretty much almost seemed mandatory that they needed to do to protect their turf inside of the very lucrative P.T. Barnum housing projects. Now, word on the streets had to be out about this gang because they would perform shootings in broad day right in the middle of the housing projects, but it seems like they would start to have cracks going down the line that would put authorities on them. And a lot of people would say that the beginning of the end will happen on April 9th, 1999, when an officer by the name of William Bailey of the Bridgeport Police Department discovered an abandoned Nissan Maxima in the P.T. Barnum complex. Now, inside the car, they're going to say officer seized a bulletproof vest, a black ski mask, approximately 50 grams of Superman labeled crack cocaine and miscellaneous items. It's going to be documents and pictures that allegedly belong to Lau and Lonnie Jones. You would also have another incident on November 6th of 1999 where Luke, Lance, and Lonnie Jones were stopped while riding together in a Toyota Camry that was driven by Luke, where authorities would discover the three brothers all wearing bulletproof vests and they would uncover four loaded semi-automatic handguns as well as clips containing additional ammunition that was seized from the pockets of Luke and Lonnie Jones. Now at the trial of Luke Jones, the jury would hear evidence about the afternoon of November the 28th, 1999, when an out of towner by the name of Montanil Lawrence was visiting two friends by the name of Veneer Holmes and Jeremy Thomas in building five of P.T. Barnum. Now, they would go on to suggest that it was a kickback and Lawrence was drunk and made several advances at Luke Jones's girlfriend, a female by the name of Shantae Tate Fillwell at the time. Now, they're going to say that they were riding in a car where Tate would turn down the advances of Lawrence and it would turn into an insult battle where she would insult his boots and he would insult her coat. Now, according to Jeremy Thomas, they were on the way to pick up Tay-Tay's cousin. Now, when they get to the destination, Mr. Thomas is going to let Mr. Lawrence know, hey, you might want to apologize. This is such and such and such and such. So once they get back in the car, he go ahead at the advice of Mr. Thomas and apologize. They shake hands. Now, it's said that once the car returned back to PT, Tay-Tay would go up to the party and tell several other individuals that Montanil Lawrence did not know who he was messing with and she would proceed to leave the party. Now, according to testimony at Lou Jones' trial, it would say 10 minutes or so would pass, then Lou Jones would end up eventually showing up at the party, asking things along the lines of who disrespected his girl. Now, Mr. Lawrence admitting to being the one that got into the altercation with Luke Jones's girlfriend, they would proceed to get into a scuffle where he would eventually be brought outside and shot and murdered. So it wasn't always about drug turf, even though they say one of the murders was a retaliation for one of his brothers being shot in the face. It was just a very dangerous place and a very dangerous time and PT at that time, especially if you was in the occupation of drug dealing. 
Now, this is a story I sat on and I wanted to get for my people in Connecticut, especially Bridgeport. Y'all been asking for it in the comment box. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. Y'all hit the bell right under this video so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. Now, all my people across the country and other countries and other nations, y'all get in the comment box. Let me know who we need to cover. Let me know who I need to do my research on. Let me know what cities we need to travel to, what we missed. Y'all make sure y'all tweet me, y'all direct message me, y'all email me, y'all text me, y'all call me, y'all CC me, y'all stop me in the street. However y'all really want to go about it, mention me, however, I'm with all this shit. Shit boy pop a lot. We're going to be back with some more real trill spill shit. It's the mob. Mob, 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 ties.